Okay, sound, sound is all right on the back? Okay, cool. Uh, so my goal today is really to try to give you an overview of what's going on at GT Orion to basically make sure GT Orion is also known here. Um, there's some cool stuff. We're a bit more focused on field robotics, and that's what I'm going to present. Also some stuff related to environment science. Uh, so just let's, let's get started. So I started with some context. Uh, so by training, I'm a software engineer. And I said, I think I don't have to say anything there. Uh, but mostly I worked on different field applications. So trying to get robots to do stuff, quite an applied guys, uh, have easy links with GTRI, for instance, because we try to, we, so there's also this aspect of getting things applied. Um, yeah, so you said everything. I don't have to spend there, time there. So what I want to do here, I want to know you to know what's there at DTRN, because one of the side effects is to actually see if some of you want to go and spend some time over there. Uh, I want to show you some of the hardware we have, some of the infrastructure we have, uh, some of the people we have as well, and then spend some time on the research I'm doing and conducting there. Uh, a lot on environment, ma natural environment mapping, uh, some on automation for environment science, and a bit on robotics as well. So let's get started. Uh, first, some hardware. So we have quite a few robots. We focus on getting outdoor. I mean, the bottom ones are our two main research tools are the this little boat and the husky on the right. Uh, on the top, we also have a Kinova arm, but you have like thousands of them here. Uh, and we have plenty of Totterbots that we use mostly for teaching. Um, the thing I put on top right is a LiDAR tracking system. I put that here because not, since, a few, since a year now, we have also all the tools we need to do ground truths in outdoor settings. Ground truths for 3D localization, ground truths for 3D mapping. Uh, I mean, these things get, get you millimeter points over a kilometer, so it's really, really nice. And the thing on the right, I'll just talk about that on the, in a minute, that's a robot that drives on walls with magnetic wheels, and it's used mostly for inspection. So here is a tiny wall that's our testing ground at the university, but the goal is to go for large tankers, storage tanks. I'll discuss that in a minute. Um, quite a bit of hardware, so localization. Um, okay, just, just to know that we have stuff, okay? Some GPUs, actually GPUs are much easier to use over there than here, from what I've heard. I understand that, e well, it's easy to, to, when we want to reserve them, just write our name into a spreadsheet and we're done. So, yeah, it's a good argument, I would say. And quite a few, well, right now we have around nine PhD students. It's, uh, you know, it's something which is changing, but just to give you an idea of the, of the state of the project, we do around 10, 20 uh, semester projects per year, per semester, and some master thesis as well. So just, okay, let's give you a scale, an idea of scale. Now, let's, that was all for the context. Let's talk about uh, research activities. So I'll start with some project on robotics. I'm not, not sure I'm not creating any lesson there. Uh, I'll start with the BugRide 2 project. BugRide 2 is, uh, is a project on ship hull inspection. It's one of these big EU projects. I don't know exactly what's the equivalent in the NSF landscape. Uh, it covers 21 partners across, across Europe, around 9 million euros, 9 million dollars. And we are coordinating that. Uh, the goal is to build the tools that can work towards the inspection of large ships. And in this type of project, we try to get the full uh, value chain. So we get some ship owners, some people work, some legal expert, some uh, people building robots, some people providing services. So all the chains. So I wanted to show these pictures because I find them quite interesting. Uh, what you see on top is a big tanker while being uh, inspected and cleaned. For scale, the little dot here is a human. Okay, let's see the mouse, it'll be easier. There's a human there, uh, just to give you an idea of the scale. Uh, this is scaffolding, a five-story scaffolding, there's another human there, uh, just to give you the size of these things. Um, so they need to be inspected regularly. Uh, obviously, if you want to dry dog these guys, it's a huge cost, so if it could be done without dry dogging them, it would be much easier. So we're looking at bringing it robots on the hull, around the hull, flying for the aerial part and underwater systems. Okay, 21 partners, 11, 11 universities across Europe trying to work on that. Uh, COVID didn't really help. 
But okay, so just a few, few tests we did at the beginning, you know, when we we're first starting, just to give you an idea of the problem. So we had this robot here driving on the wall. Uh, it's a bit weird, but you not know, just uh, have to see magnetic wheels, they're just big cylindrical, cylindrical magic magnets. And 3D mapping tasks, so you can see uh, that it's, it's a pretty uh, featureless environment. But there are things to do. Obstacle avoidance is interesting. It's a, if you want to look at the math side, it's, uh, it's a 3D manifold. It's a 2D manifold embedded in 3D, so you can do some kind of nice localization and planning task on that. Uh, the mapping is mostly with LiDAR because it's so featureless, but there's some interesting things you can, uh, you, you can do in there. So that was the first test. Now the real challenge is how to localize in there, how to control, how to plan, because you really have to account for the fact that it's a big, smooth surface. Um, and that's for just for the crawler, which is what we are doing. So the crawler is a magnetic real robot. At the global scale, the problem is that we have this heterogeneous team of robots, UAV, AUVs, crawlers. How do we like, coordinate all of these teams? Even if we have multiple of each team, how do we distribute them across a big surface like that? Um, also, how we bring in HRI with immersive interfaces and how to include that. So we do something which is quite fun on this respect, is that we bring in psychologists to help us design this HRI that try to take into account how to create trust into the system. Because at some point, someone will have to sign off. Okay, this ship is seaworthy. And, and when you sign off that, you're taking some responsibility. So they have to trust that the measurement has been done. The so regulation says that all the measurements have to be done at hand reach. That's the definition of the, of the scale. Um, and so we also work with legal experts and try to work at the UN level to change the policy. Uh, it takes time. It's a very slow process, but we have some experts from the uh, International Maritime Organization and we can, we can get access to UN level. And also inspection technologies, I'll discuss that a little bit, how to work with acoustic waves. There's some fun some things to do there. Uh, some other examples we did, so that's the robot on the left here, that's a storage tank, 20 meter high, 40 meter in diameter. Uh, it's not as big as a tanker, but it's significant. It's quite featureless, so I think one thing, one of, some of the things I would like to try there is maybe to use some photogrammetry and some albedo type of uh, mapping that may actually be useful. And what you see on the right is actually a video. It's one of the most boring video. Uh, that's this inspection, inspection videos, when they're working, they're boring because nothing happened, everything works. Okay, so you have a robot that makes a straight line. Okay, that's all. Um, actually, behind that, there's a cool localization system which is constrained by the manifold. There's the uh, bit of control system that takes into account the shape of the, of the environment and so on. Okay, just quickly going through all that. Uh, you see, I'll jump topics from topics to topics. I hope you don't find that too uh, confusing. At the end, we can ask questions on specific topics if you want. I'll move to something related to reinforcement learning and something called Dreamer. I mean, you may have known Dreamer. Dreamer, I think, comes from is it Google or Facebook? One of these guys. Google, yeah, okay. Uh, so Dreamer is pretty cool. It's mostly, look at the paper, it's mostly in simulation. So we try to see how we get Dreamer to work on a real environment. Okay, how do we perceive that? We have papers on that, so I'm not going to go into detail, also because I'm not sure I'll be good enough to actually give you the details. It's a PhD student work. But I want to show some of the ideas. So we look at, we try to apply that on the board. Uh, we have basically a GP, um, a small Xavier board on, on, Xavier board on board, uh, and we look at a task of uh, shore following. Looks like reactive navigation. With such a system, it's very, very dynamic. It's got a lot of inertia. The water is very nonlinear. So we need a way to synthesize a controller that is robust to different conditions. What you don't really see on the right, it's actually not that clear, is that this situation where the lake is actually frozen. So there's a thin layer of ice in there. We still want our system, well, the ice, Ice is small enough that we can actually drive through it, can crush it, but it breaks the dynamics when it tries to turn. So we want to, to build a robust controller, and that's where reinforcement learning and specifically Dreamer is working. So in this case, we tried really to get, I mean, we have one paper on how to build the curriculum to get the system to learn by creating more and more complex situations. Also, how to attack the dynamics, how to create more and more complex dynamics so that a dreamer can get uh, better and better. We also do zero-shot learning, so, zero, so which means that we 
learn everything in simulation and then test on the real system, deploy on the real system. Testing on the real system wouldn't be, really work. Uh, Dreamer, because it's so uh, sample efficient, is actually quite a good, uh, good tool. Some of the, um, so it's still a quite long process. I think it's, one, it's around one day of, tra of training. The question is how to get a sim to real barrier, and that's quite challenging. So I'm not going to go in details on how a Dreamer works. Either you know it or you don't. If you, you want to know more, I probably need to look at the papers. Uh, what I want to look at is some of the results. Okay, so that one of the, that's the lake on which we're testing, a kilometer of, uh, it's a kilometer of lakeshore, and all driven by Dreamer. Uh, now we, got, we got kilometers of going around there. Um, so it's pretty stable. Some of the challenge there is if you don't have a, right, a good controller, you can't really do the tight turn on the, on the left there. Uh, you really need to anticipate that because you need to, it's a bit like drifting on a car, you know, the car from uh, aerospace. It's a bit like drifting, but it's much, much slower motion. Uh, the interesting thing is we train Dreamer purely in simulation with a model which is what it is and the simulation gazebo. So it's not, not a great simulation, especially for hydrodynamics. But, okay, we try to make it to re-change the conditions. We make the water syrupy. We try to make, uh, to add wind. To, to break one of the motors, uh, to, uh, to also make the robot starts at very weird places. I go through these three graphs that are measured on the real system. The task is to follow the shore at one meter per second uh, at 10 meters from the shore. On green, it's the ideal deployment. So you basically train Dreamer, deploy it on the system, and, and let it run. And you see that basically the task, even though the task is learned in simulation, is done fairly well. Um, when we add the ice, distance control is still doing fairly, fairly well. Uh, when we remove any notion of knowledge of velocity, that becomes a bit harder. Systems tend to overshoot the, the distance and the velocity, but it's doing okay. <laughs> in terms of velocity, clearly when you add ice, it becomes harder, okay, so it's slowing down. Uh, we don't, you don't, when you don't tell it its velocity, it tends to overshoot and always drive it. Not full speed, but it has some knowledge of how to, how to work. What's interesting is that we get the controller which is much more efficient in power. So that's actually a complete side effect. It's not something we planned at all, but it's much better than any of the other controller we have if, in terms of uh, on power. Okay. I'm just giving you a broad picture there. I mean, if, if someone's interested, we can discuss more or I can refer you to the work of the student. Some of the things we need to do to add some kind of safety layer, add more interaction with agents, okay, especially the swans are pretty good at attacking the boat. Mm -hmm. um, well, and they're very smart. They're not attacking like physically. Uh, th we've been doing tests very regularly and they've understood that the boat is following the shore. They've understood that if they approach a boat from the outside, the boat will mostly ignore them. But if they approach it from the inside, then the boat will actually try to avoid them. So some of the swans have learned to actually come inside and peel the, road, peel, peel the boat off the shore, take it to the middle of the lake, and then fly away. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, animal learning, much better than machine learning. Um, the other thing I wanted to show is a bit of ISAC. I don't know if some of you worked with ISAC. It's amazing. Uh, if you worked with Gazebo, before, I mean, we, with Gazebo, we put a few trees and then everything slows down. With ISAC, we put 10,000 assets and everything flows at, at uh, 100 of FPS. Um, and it's beautiful. So at now we're moving a lot of the simulation on ISAC. We can do, have a lot faster simulation, a lot more agents. Uh, there's really cool stuff there. And it's linked to, to ROS. So what you see on the right is the RV's perception. So it's directly out. It's a bit in better, better shape. You need to interact a bit on the forum with the designers, but it's really, really good, really, really fast. Okay, moving on. Um, talk a, bit, a, bit, a little bit about exploration. So related to RL as well, try to work also with natural environments. So how do we map, how do we explore in a natural environment? So here we have, on the left, we have the Husky moving around. Uh, with these trees, I think it's uh, end of fall. On the right, uh, this is gazebo in this case, with the with set of uh, dead trees, kind of winterland. Um, and actually, from a perception point of view, it's a very similar environment. So what you get from a lighter, when you get from the ouster, 
uh, hostel 16 in this case, is very similar. So the question is how do we use this information to build a map and to drive an exploration policy? So what is a good quality map in this type of environment? It's, if you look at all the papers, they talk about maps and look at the mostly surface. They assume everything is dense. When you get a laser, when the laser is hitting something, is hitting a wall, you're looking at a line. Um, if you look at trees, I like to call trees semi-transparent fractal structures. But it's trees is a, it's smaller, it's easier to say. Um, so they're really hard to look to, to work with with a lighter. Sometimes the light as the lighter goes through, sometimes it doesn't. You have a very sparse map in the end. So we try to see how to explore that, how to quanti quali first how to qualify the quality of the construction. Um, it looks like a trivial problem. But once you've got an octomap map and you have the ground truth, how do you say, okay, this is a good reconstruction, this is a bad reconstruction? Um, it's not that easy. Uh, we looked at different solutions, uh, ended up with something called the Wasserstein distance, which is uh, a var variation on the Earth movers distance. So it's a way to, d to get the distance between two distributions. And we also try to show that we can create proxies that can be used to predict that the distribution is, will be good. Okay. So how do you, you, first, how you measure that the reconstruction, reconstruction is good? And second, can you get something that you can measure in real time without ground truth? And tell you, that tells you, okay, now normally my distance, my reconstruction should be good. I have enough measurements. Um, in the end, it's fairly. Uh, it's, the goal is to link that with a musero type of um, exploration policy, but this is ongoing. In the end, the results are somewhat intuitive, uh, it, but we can we can prove in this case that if you get a good spherical variance of the viewpoint and enough points, then you will really you can get a threshold above which you can somewhat guarantee that reconstruction can be good and you can, we can have a way to estimate this threshold. Okay. It's somewhat intuitive, but it's nice to be able to prove it and to get, to get some statistical testing that shows what is the right threshold at which it becomes a good quality reconstruction and we can predict it's a good quality even though there's no way to get the ground truth in a, in a natural environment. Even with a fancy light LiDAR we have, and I showed at the beginning, you always have occlusion, it's super hard to get ground truth. Okay, and just last thing on robots, this is starting, so I don't have results on that, I don't have, uh, but we are trying to start looking at GANs for generating plans, a GAN for planning. I don't know where that will go, so that's something that, is, uh, that will be collaboration with CalThrough, and the goal is to link GAN for uh, planning, scene understanding with AI, and to actually do some tasks where you can work on things which are, looks all the same, and in particular here we look at the servo motors, they're all somewhat similar, but they're all somewhat different. So at this stage, you can't recycle them. You just have to crush them, which is recycling, but it's not a good way to do it. So if we could get ways to generalize, and that's the point of GAN, um, to create plan for disassembly, then maybe there's a chance to recycle them in a better way. Okay. This is a dream. Uh, this is this kind of dream you sell when you, do, when you want a grant. Now, we'll see where we get. No, sometimes it works. Sometimes we do what we, what we say, but at the po some point we have to sell some dream. It's a dream, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, just, this is just starting. I'll move on a bit on mapping and SLAM. And uh, I'll start with something which is very weird. I don't think, this is something where we nearly have all our paper published because we are the only one doing it. There's another lab at USC which does something which is vaguely similar, um, which is mapping in metal plates. So what do we have? Uh, well, if you have a robotics crawler like that, you have a transducer in there, an acoustic transducer. It's like, it's like hitting a board, but you hit it at uh, 100 kilohertz. You get this kind of signal there where the waves, which are a bit stronger, correspond to echoes from, plate, from the side of the plate. And yeah, the waves tend to behave a bit wave like that. So I mean, here, it looks like wave in water, uh, they are about 10 nanometer high, uh, and they move at about 3,000 3, meters per second. But apart from that, it's a bit like uh, mapping a pond from the, from the waves on the water. And actually, we can run something. This is fast slam running on there. Uh, what you see on the left as a trajectory from fast slam is we are reconstructing. Sorry, I need to play that again. Um, we are reconstructing the, the shape of a plate. So what you see here 
are edges. So we are moving on a plate, detecting echoes, reconstructing a trajectory that's fast slam. What you see here is some kind of beam, beam forming map that you can get by mixing all these ultrasonic signals. It's a bit weird, I mean, not, not as, as an application, but uh, it's interesting we can, just by moving around, we can get some estimation of what is the shape of the plate. And that's on a real robot, so it's just a test plate we, we're working with on the lab. Uh, what you see here, you see the real signals. In there, some of that is our echoes. The waves are actually bouncing back and forth on the plate, it's very noisy. Um, and what you see here is now obvious the reconstruction of the map and also some occupancy grid that tells us where are the inside, and all that in a fast slam framework. The beam forming map is visible there. At the beginning, it's very, very noisy, but it gets better um, as it moves around, and then it very quickly converges to something which is fairly good estimation of the, of the map. So here it's driven by hand. Because the challenge here is that you, the echoes tell you where is inside, but not what is outside. Okay, so you, and you've got a lot of echoes that, when you, if you see an echo, it's probably that the border, there's a border closer than that. But you may have missed the first echo, so it's hard to tell. Okay, all those little things which are feasible, so I pause the video for time. First one is actually the acoustic wave propagation is very complicated. It's like if you were in air, the sound is moving at the same speed independently of pitch. In metal, if you, uh, if you go to higher frequencies, it typically goes faster, uh, yeah, faster. Uh, so you have some models that can be tuned that depend on thickness, that depend on material. Um, and what we have here is a bit of machine learning that actually try to optimize the propagation model as the system runs and get a better estimate of the um, of the reconstruction by estimating the propagation speed for the given frequencies. So without knowing the material, without knowing the thickness. And what you see at the bottom, um, that's when you have a tiny reflector in, on the plate. So in red, no, in blue, you have a defect-free signal. In red, you have a same signal but with the echoes from the defect. Um, you don't really see them because they are very similar there's a slight tiny variation, which is due to the echoes of this re reflector. So if you build the SLAM map, you get what you have here, so that's an occupancy map, let's say. Uh, but once you know where the edges are, and you can estimate the geometry, you can remove that from signal. And what you see on the right is basically an estimation of where the re reflector is. Okay. And the difference between the, I mean, it's pretty tiny. These are simulation data. Uh, so it's probably feasible to do it. We haven't drilled on, or we haven't drilled on, on plate yet because every time we need to change the setup, we need to drill again. So it's a bit painful. Okay, a bit weird. I guess nobody's seen this type of stuff before. Um, but yeah, there's quite interesting stuff in which are the main application, and we, are, we have a Facebook engineer also working with us on that. Uh, you can have the same problem. We try to map the room to actually cancel the echoes from the room or can't do noise cancellation. Okay, you could try to reconstruct. Now, here we have a moving object, so it's a slam problem. If you don't have a moving object, it becomes a bit harder to estimate the geometry of the, of the room. Now, a bit of more image processing. Okay. Still all around natural environment. Um, so, we have this lake I showed you earlier the thing that may, helps the swans learn is that for three years, four years, we've been going around the same lake every two weeks and collecting images. So we have around six million images collected every two weeks in the same environment. Uh, we, um, with fogs, snow, very strong sun, very low sun, and all, all that. Uh, there's 16,000 images pairs that we've collected. We've made an image localization benchmark with a challenge of trying to identify which images are the same or not. If you want to train a network or if you want to train something to learn uh, to recognize a place over season, this is something we can use. One thing we found, uh, well, actually, just to give you a few examples. So this is the same place. Uh, so fairly difficult to get all the reflection of the water, change of, change of foliage. Uh, slight change of viewpoint. Sometimes the water moves by one meter in height, so we've got also some viewpoint changes. 
very challenging. Uh, but one thing we found is that semantic segmentation is fairly robust to most of these changes. And um, what's interesting is that most of, the most of the contour of the semantic segmentation are staying the same independently of the season. So we looked at semantic edges, and then we built, uh, actually, well, one thing is, this is interesting, this is the hardest problem we have all the time, this is sun glares. Very painful, because when you move, they stay at the same place. Um, very, well, and yeah, it's very hard to handle, actually. But maybe we could just learn, train a network to remove them, or again, to, to, again, to in-paint them. It would be interesting. Um, so in the end, we got some, some results on recognition based on getting some geometry uh, between the profile of the contour, so the semantic edges, and some elements of the appearance. But now that was for his monocular vision, very hard. So we went to 3D. 3D is better, easier. Um, so we built this little backpack, which is our 3D mapping backpack. And basically, the goal is to move, to map this complicated environment. If you want to build a robot that can move in there, either you can buy a cheetah or you can buy uh, one of these quadrupeds, but they're expensive, or you can uh, find a few sandwiches and uh, a PhD student and a backpack way more efficient. Um, and so in, in what we have here uh, on the backpack, we have this RoboSense LiDAR. It's not used very much. Half, half sphere field of view, 50 meter range, a lot of points in 3D, and three cameras. And what we did, uh, so here, that's a semantic map. So we have a very good extrinsics because we 3D printed a lot of it. So we can project the pixels to the point cloud and get colored point cloud. And if we run the point clouds for semantic segmentation, we can also project the segmentation to the point cloud. So in the end, we have 3D uh, um, semantic point cloud that we can uh, build. And it's linked with localization with IMU. So what you see here is the accumulated point cloud over time. Um, and uh, that with GPS, so we have a small, uh, an INS system on, on top of it. So that's where just the raw INS data will give us this kind of precision. So in the end, maybe half a meter of precision over the, over the scale of one kilometer. So you can get nice 3D reconstruction. You can fly through that. Uh, you can, we go through PostGraph, ICP, to we get a nice 3D reconstruction. And then we go for multi-season. So for one year, every month, we went through the same environment, same path, collecting the data from uh, you know, January with all the snow there. And... Uh, yeah, every month all the data. So we got all these things, and if someone's interested in this kind of data set with you know, 3D reconstruction, um, place recognition, season invariant features, all this kind of thing, the data set is or will be available, but easy to share. If you have a few terabytes, we can share it easily. Uh, there's also some, some human, human changes in some places, some construction that happen. So if you want to work on change detection, that's there as well. Okay, that was the mapping part. Now, I'll finish with some work on um, apply, uh, applying computational perception to environment science uh, with two main topics and then a remain miscellaneous stuff. So the first one is diatoms. Diatoms are small microorganisms. You actually drink them everywhere in the water. Even in pure water, you always have some of them. They are super tiny. You can't really get rid of all of them. It doesn't matter. They're completely harmless. Um, they're small algae. You see them with a the microscope. These are microscope images. And there are many, many different species. They call, it, they call them taxa. Uh, so many different species. They're all very similar. But it's important to identify them and to count them because that's part of, of indices that define the quality of the environment. Uh, so we work on the de detection pipeline, mostly this type of typical detection machine learning. Uh, problem, then a bit of classification. On the detection side, it's painful to label, so we work with synthetic images. Uh, we have some individual samples that have been pre-selected, so we create some random, some artificial slides and, uh, and build on that. And as you would expect, but actually it's interesting from a biology point of view, um, if you do just training on synthetic and, de and deploy, you get some good results. If you just train from scratch with only a few images, you get some results that are okay, but if you do one step after the other, I mean, no surprise, 
you get very good results in detection. Um, we've recently been moving to YOLO v5, if some of you have been using that for rotated bounding box, really great, works out of, out of the box. Uh, we are trying different solutions for rotated bounding box and that's really uh, a life, life changer. Uh, very important for us because for the biologists, they want to get size of individuals. And if you get uh, this type of axis aligned bounding box, it's not that useful for size. So the rotated bounding box is really nice. Again, uh, using the pre-trained detection, well, the synthetic data set helps a lot. Another thing for classification, that's fun, it's actually a problem you don't have very much in most of the standard data set. The diatoms are very similar and at the same time very different. So what you see on the left are three different species. Uh, the number of, of lines on top is a bit different, the tapering at the end is a bit different. So they're completely different species. What you see on the right, it's, it's the same species, but seen from a different point, point of view. So we get huge uh, interclass similarity and huge interclass vari or intraclass variance. So what we worked with, well, for the interclass similarity, uh, that's what you use triplet loss for, so that's common. Uh, what we did for the intra in uh, intraclass variance is we introduced clustering into the learning. So you do a pre-learn, Cluster your, the features from your network in, for a given class with X means, for instance, identify if you can separate them out, create some virtual classes, retrain, iterate, and then in the end, we, um, we don't, don't get a huge boost in accuracy, but we get a lot, maybe out of the 160 species, there's 20 more that we can classify without any errors. And for us, it's a good improvement. That's, that's one of the metrics which is important for us in our detection. But yeah, the clustering in the specific set where you got a, this huge interclass similarity and interclass variance, that was actually a fairly easy solution to get a uh, good classification. Also a very unbalanced data set. So, but that's, uh, if you work with real data, that, opens a lot, that hap happens a lot. Another thing, so Frank, you've, see, you've seen some of these images on uh, 3D reconstruction and wood. So here we work with, we try to predict the interior of wood project called Wood Sear, try to guess what's inside the wood from the shape on the outside. If you own a sawmill, you can, and you're rich, you can buy a five million x-ray machine for trees. The trees we go through, you get some kind of a map of the interior, then decide how to cut it, because every place you can cut without knots will be worth 10 times the place where you can cut with, with knots. But if you wait to have cut before decided that, then you've lost value. So you need to get a cut plan, or plan, well, some kind of plan for cutting. I don't know how to say that. Uh, what we try to do is to see if we can predict the interior from the outside appearance, from the geometry. So different ways to do that. One way is to do it in the field and how to build reconstruction. So in this case, we use this gyro stabilized camera, uh, this small Osmo. It's 400 euros it's, or 400 dollars. I don't know. Uh, very cool. Very great images. And uh, because it's gyro stabilized, you can easily process them. Uh, they, and then a bit of machine learning to extract the foreground and the bark. And then you get a big data set of images which just look at the tree and you can reconstruct a 3D model of trees. Okay. Very neat, very high precision. One thing I'm not discussing here, we train GAN to generate trees, artificial trees. Uh, and they look pretty cool. We try to go to a forestry expert, ask them to distinguish between the the synthetic trees and the real trees and they couldn't make the difference. So that may be something for asset generation in uh, games. So I'm very, going very quickly in there. So let's just pause that for a second. So what you see on the left is a 3D structure of a piece of tree. Uh, you can see a little bit, you can see where there are bumps where there are scars from old branches. So this is a scar for instance. Uh, this is for pine tree. Pine trees have a fairly easy structure. We try to exploit that for all the things, but for pine trees, it's somewhat easy. What you see on the right, uh, on the, it's uh, got three things there. In red, it's the X-ray of the interior of a tree. So the tree goes through the X-ray. Uh, you get the, reflect, the reflectance from X-ray. In white is, at a given space, the border of the tree, so ge geometry of a layer of the tree. So if you integrate the white surface, you get the left video. 
and in yellow are the predicted knots, where the knots are given the 3D. Okay, so, and so it's transparent, so you see the, the knots below it. So we go along the length of the tree. Basically, we see it going through the X-ray. Uh, so, and you can see when there is some prediction. There's also some um, Monte Carlo dropout to get some, some uncertainty estimation. So what you see here is that we are predicting where the knots are just from the geometry. So at least for pine trees, it looks it's feasible. Uh, you have that on the right here. Uh, in green, I think, are the real knots, and in red, the predicting one. So there's an offset, which is mostly due to, to um, alignment of the LSTM that is doing that. But actually, it's easier for visualization, so we left the offset. But okay, so there's a slight offset due to the LSTM itself. So yeah, for pine trees, it's okay. Now we're trying to go for real um, deciduous trees, and it's much harder. Oak, beech, much harder to predict because they are not so structured inside. But yeah, that's a bit of machine learning tools we are doing. And I'll finish with my miscellaneous thing. First, some AI, AI for biodiversity. That's something we are just starting, trying to see if you can use AI to quantify biodiversity. So what you see here are planktons just to see the diversity of classes. There are data sets around, out there with planktons with billions of images. Some of them, some of them labeled as well. Uh, so it's quite interesting stuff to do there. Uh, I've put some weird publication title uh, because I thought that's something, so I think my, that's my favorite. Uh, I think it's, it's, okay, it's pretty tiny. So the title is Do Thousand Elephant Seals Behave Like Weather Boy? Okay, they do actually. We worked on IMUs, uh, on IMU data from elephant seals. Uh, you may know, probably not, that most of the data for the weather prediction on the Southern Ocean, Antarctic Ocean, is actually collected by elephant seals with sensors, which are collecting data and sending it twice a day to, by satellites. They get the depth of the water, because elephant seals are basically just going up and down all the time. It's true, like there's 30 minutes. Dive, hunt, come back, breathe, three minutes, dive. 24 hours a day, Don't, never stop. So every six, every 12 hours, they send data by satellites and you get all the water column uh, and the temperature of the old water columns in all the fields. Um, yeah, I'm quite proud also on the one on journal of antibi antimicrobial chemotherapy on using computer vision to, to help track the effect of uh, the genes involved in the dissemination of antibiotic resistance. So that's pretty cool. Uh, mostly computer vision, simple computer vision, but a big impact. And, and also weird, weird stuff. Yeah, detecting charcoal, charcoal platforms from the 20th century, well, 19th century through LiDAR images using a bit of deep learning as well. Um, and some special problems on weird stuff. So you, there's some T's detection on the, well, actually a bit more than T's detection, but start with this detection on the, on the X-ray of the lower jaws. Uh, some bird tags detection and readings. Uh, you don't see that very much, but it's a toad here. You have some underpass, so it's legally, when you do a road through a wetland in France, you have to create some underpass to avoid crushing the amphibians. And uh, if you create that, you also have to monitor it. So they, these, these people putting camera in the, in the underpass and counting toads. Right now, they sent us the images for this year's season, and they have 300,000 images that they have to go through one by one. They're not happy about that, so we try to see if we can do it with a detection system. Um, these here are roots. You get a transparent pipe in the earth, a camera in the pipe, and you see how the roots are growing. It's a bit like watching the grass grow, very slow. Uh, but again, here we have 100,000 images hand labeled by technicians with, with the drone, because they've drawn all the routes. And so the goal is, can we use segmentation for that? How we, can we reconstruct the network structures of routes? How can we deal with very thin, tiny objects? Quite challenging, actually, in, uh, even for segmentation networks. These are shrimps, which are a good indication of uh, presence of pollutants in water. The activity is, is, is linked to the presence of pollutants. So again, mostly tracking, detection, uh, camera filters, typical things. 
And the one on the bottom here is for, it's actually a geyser prediction, using a bit of AI to predict the time between eruptions. I think that's uh, Old Faithful in the, uh, which park, Yellowstone? Which park has the, all the geysers? Yes, that's Yosemite, yeah. So yeah, so, so we tried to, we, we got data from the rangers and uh, yeah, why is it processed in France? Because one of the OMSCS students went for a semester in France and wanted to do that. So, yeah, sure. Why not? So, it looks like a mess. Um, but in pr principle, we, are, we have a lot of applications, but on, only a few core common techniques that we use everywhere. Uh, machine vision, machine learning, optimization, all of that are all used and reused in the same different context. Um, there's a bit of a gap with robotics, but still the same techniques. Some of the techniques get reused. Uh, RL is also going to help as well. So I'd like to finish with something on the collaboration opportunity, opportunities. Uh, if you want to come to GTL, it's easy. Uh, even come from a semester. It's, uh, yeah, faculty, students, everybody's, everybody's will, welcome. So there's a GTL office here on the campus, and they can help you with all the visa stuff. It's super easy. To, uh, to, to come for one semester or more. Uh, we have a lot of data, happy to share that. Uh, we are happy to do joint experiments, uh, especially for outdoor field deployments. We have the tools for it, I think, now. Uh, master thesis, if you want to do one semester here, one semester there, also pretty cool. And we, I think it's out of state, it's in-state tuition also. That's uh, a side, uh, side note. And I think that's all. Thank you. Questions. So I'm going to tell you three things first. The first thing, tomorrow, starting at 12.30, in this very room, is the Iron Robotics Research Showcase. At the end of the day, there will be snacks and demos and posters <laughs> out there. And uh, there will be at least a mobile manipulator and a humanoid called Digit roaming around, I think. Should be cool. Matt Mason's given the keynote to come back. Second thing, they have better experimental robots uh, than we do in terms of field robotics. If you're a field robotics person, uh, you would benefit from spending time and uh, if you're a professor who might like to go teach a class in France, uh, that's easy to do. Professor Dellert has done it <laughs> and tells you all the benefits and the wonders of doing such a thing. Third thing, Cedric is here until Friday. I'm here until Friday. My schedule is... If you to talk to him, you can. Yep. He's accessible. And uh, you can either meet him at the end of this talk to schedule something or talk to me and I can help schedule something as well. Now, questions for Cedric. Yes. Okay, so when you work with the acoustics part and you, the transducer, yeah, so the transducer needs to be coupled. I see I have an expert here um, because otherwise the sound, otherwise you have a layer of air between the transducer and the, and the steel. So in this system, they actually inject water. So you got a small water chamber which is uh, in plastic touching the steel. The transducer is half a millimeter away from the steel and you inject water to fill this space with water. And um, the, the impedance of water is good enough that so it transmits the waves to the, to the metal plate, even at 100 kilohertz. It's not very good medium, but for one millimeter, it's sufficient. Yes? Have you been able to generalize this to like other interfaces between like plate and ceramic? Because it seems like it's mostly like plate, air, to the background, right? Um, so we mostly work with the, just the metal yeah, I'm not sure exactly where you're going. What, the, what application are you thinking about? Like, if it's a plate, I'll have more plates, right? Will that still work? Okay, well you have, if you have multiple layers, or if you have a composite material, um, it really depends on the material property. So that's an, that's an Amy question. Okay. You will need to talk to, um, uh, okay, there's an acoustic guy here in Amy which is really good at that. Um, it's harder in composite material because they are dispersive, so the, the waves attenuate. Uh, we're still doing that a little bit. The, I'm not considering that because from a robotics point of view, I still need to be able to move on the surface. So some people are working on robotic system for applying that on aircraft wings. Um, different solutions, either you do it on the, on the upper part or you have some vacuum-based ad uh, adherence mechanism or some uh, venturi effect. Different solutions. Uh, but it, yeah, it's harder for composite. 
it's, but it's an Amy question. It's mostly, uh, well, it's Amy in the sense that you have to know how your wave is propagating. Uh, you can't make magical things. The waves don't propagate, they don't propagate. Uh, if they attenuate, they attenuate, so we won't see as far. Here in metal, metal rings very far, so we can send the wave very far, also, but the energy still dissipates. Um, so, and now the question, the side question is, can we work with something else than a square? Yes, it can. We can, as long as it's convex, it's possible to estimate the geometry. We, with non-convex structures, it becomes a bit too complicated. Yes. That's the main application. So the main problems we try to detect are corrosions, and corrosion is basically a removal of material. Actually, in a real ship, the corrosion happens in the inside part. So you scan from the outside, and the corrosion happens on the other side. So it, yeah, you, that's the way you measure uh, sickness. So normally, the way it's done is that you move at different places, and you do point measurement. Uh, so it's obviously quite imperfect. Uh, we hope to get something better with wave propagating. It's actually quite challenging because there's m many things that are interacting. The welds are interacting. The stiffener behind the plates are also interacting. We are working now on detecting the stiffness. And it looks like once we get a geometry from the edges, we can remove that and we can detect the stiffness in some conditions. Uh, but yeah. Does it matter what frequency you use? Very much. Very much. Okay, so you're right, um, but that's, you mostly do that if you want to go uh, and do sickness measurement. Uh, with a wave here, we, we're interested in propagating in a long way, and that doesn't work very well with composite. Even if you change the frequency, it's just too absorbing. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. I have no idea, honestly, but um, this are uh, these German guys that want to do that. They, uh, yeah, they want to use GAN for planning. I have no idea how that works and what to work. But I think the output of the GAN in this case would be graph or trees. Um, yeah, I have no idea. I can't answer that. Uh, on, our, on our side, we'll assume that if we get a plan, we'll instantiate it based on the scene understanding where we can detect the different objects. Um, it's mostly an industry, well, toward industrial demonstrations. Yeah. Sorry, can't answer that. Yeah. Oh, UAV and AUVs. They are part of the of the Bug Ride Two project because it's a European scale project. Uh, but all the partners are dealing with the AUV and UAVs. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Do, do you have any things which are like nationwide pro programs like that in the in US? I don't know. Do you know? Yeah, we have like four or five AI institutes. So, yeah, so they're, but they're smaller institutes, so maybe half a dozen institutes. Typically, the academic institutions are taking most of the money and doing research, and there are industrial partners that are not taking so much money, but hope to sort of, you know, interact and do applications that benefit from it. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's the same kind of spirit that we have. Like, yes, yeah, industry, industry hope to get new product. And in some, re some respects they have. Like, for instance, the company building the AUV or the underwater systems, um, they get a new product out. They could develop a new product which is more autonomous, better sensors, better perception, a small arm, and so on. And they get, it's already on the market.